What Sanford Porter is unleashing on imported South American fire ants is worse than any science fiction movie you can imagine. In an effort to turn back a seemingly unstoppable invasion across the southeastern United States, he's grabbed one of the fire ants' nastiest enemies from their native land and brought them up here, the forid fly. Okay, over here is, is a close-up of one of the flies, and you need to take a good look at that because that's the closest you'll ever see one of these things. These are very little flies, and they're small for a reason, and the reason they're small is that they live in the heads of fire ants. The forward flies are parasitoids, which means they kill their hosts as opposed to parasites who keep their hosts alive. These flies aren't the silver bullet solution to controlling fire ants. They're just one of many methods being tested to combat the invaders but they are likely the most graphic. The fly starts the process by diving down onto an ant and injecting an egg into its body. The, the egg will hatch a couple of days later and the little maggot worms his way up into the ant's head. The ant still runs around and behaves normally for about two weeks. At the end of that time, they, the fly maggot, which has been slurping body juices up to that point, it releases a chemical that causes the membranes that hold the ant's body together to dissolve. And the ant's head falls off, the body crumples to the side, still twitching a little bit, and the maggot is eating all of the brains, the muscles, the glands in the ant's head, and then it pushes in and out of the mouth opening to push away the mouth opening, and, and pupates uh, inside the ant's head using it like a cocoon or a pupil case. Several weeks later, the uh, fly completes its development in the ant's head, and it pops open the cap on the, on the uh, pupa and, and the, the ant's head and crawls out, expands its wings, and starts looking for more fire ants. At that point, the cycle repeats. Black imported fire ants first appeared in the U.S. around Mobile, Alabama between 1910 and 1920, followed by red imported fire ants in the 1930s. Both probably caught rides on cargo ships from South America. They immediately set themselves apart from native fire ants by their ability to reproduce and spread quickly. Since their natural enemies were back in South America, there was nothing here to keep them in check. Working so closely with fire ants can be a tricky business. Most of them range in size from 2 to 5 millimeters, and each ant will sting you 2 to 3 times if it possibly can. Generally, uh, I, I don't mind being stung a few times. I try to avoid it. but. Uh... It's uh, an occupational hazard that I live with. I'd never been stung by a fire ant, so I wanted to see just what the big deal was. I let Porter put one on my wrist. He's biting you with his front end, and his hind end is stinging. You should feel kind of a little bit of a prick. Yeah. You feel it? Yeah. Okay. And is it starting to burn yet? Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now we'll get it off. Now, what, do you, what you're going to have the uh, pleasure yeah. of is, is hopefully you're not allergic to it. And in uh, that case, we'll be to the hospital late, later today. Porter says about 1% of the population is seriously allergic to fire ants. Luckily, I wasn't. You want to do it again? Nope. No. Nope. good. Fire ants also destroy everything from electrical junction boxes to orange trees and corn crops. Without any natural enemies, they easily overtake native ant species. To control their spread, pesticides have been used, but they just aren't practical. They're dangerous to other animals and too costly to be effective. Porter says the best way to curtail the invasion is through biological controls, like the forward flies. Natural biological control is really our only hope for permanent wide area control of the fire ants. And so we're, we're hoping that in the next few years we'll be able to start seeing the results of our efforts. Porter is about to release his fourth species of forward fly into the environment. The first species was released 10 years ago, with two other species since then. These flies are out there in the public space now, and we wanted to see them in action. We drove around the corner from Porter's lab and started digging up mounds. At first, the ants went nuts. We left for a couple minutes to dig up some other mounds, and when we came back... All right, come take a look at this. The flies had shown up, and the ants were curled into balls, trying to prevent the onslaught of fly attacks. It's a veritable slaughterhouse down there. I don't know. The, the ants are kind of trapped, and the flies are just having at them. Before releasing his flies into the wild, Porter keeps them in quarantine for anywhere from one to three years, studying them to ensure they don't become part of another problem. What we find with, with the flies here is that they only attack fire ants. They won't attack any other kinds of ants. They're not attracted to people. They're not attracted to other kinds of animals. They're not attracted to our food, our fruits. They're not attracted to, uh, to, to feces or carrion uh, 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 like other kinds of flies. Uh, basically, the only time you'll ever see these flies is hovering over a fire ant mound. 
Porter sees these flies as one part of a multifaceted solution to controlling fire ant populations. His colleagues are working on a pathogen that's also shown a lot of promise. By hitting the ants on multiple fronts, they might just get the fire ant numbers rolled back to levels seen in South America. Porter says the population of fire ants there is so low that they generally aren't even considered pests. For Discovery News, I'm James Williams.